Good morning. You are at the Sheboygan County Historical Museum for our third Saturday in October. It is October 19th, 2013, and you are going to see more of collectors and collections. Um, we have a really kind of neat lineup um, this year. We have an author, um, Dr. James Carey, who has written Echoes of the Home, which is a Civil War story, and he also has um, a diorama of the um, Civil War, so that should be very, very interesting. Then we have John Swart um, from Oostburg, who has researched um, the B-47 um, cannon um, that um, shot off some bullets um, in the area. Um, and we had three different families that were um, connected with that, the Chuni family, um, the Novotny family, and also um, another family, too the Dealey family. Um, and so we have some representatives of some of those families here today. And we have a replica of the um, B-47 that was given to them, um, one of the families by the Air Force. And we also have some a blank bullet that was given to them. So um, that is very, very interesting to hear that history. Um, then we have um, a num uh, um, number of people that represent um, some memorabilia from um, Sheboygan area. Um, we have John Mattern, who has come all the way from New uh, Mexico, but he was a Sheboygan native and grew up in Sheboygan. And he has lots of different um, artifacts of the Sheboygan area, um, which is very, very interesting. Um, then we also have um, Bill Wangman, who has very many pictures of um, the early Sheboygan, um, all different topics, so that'll be very interesting also. And then we have Scott Lewandowski, who um, has some postcards of the um, Sheboygan area. Then we have Bill Sharp, who has um, collected um, arrowheads from his um, grandfather's farm um, along the Sheboygan River, so that also um, will be interesting to see those collections. Then we also have um, teddy bears that Pat Mollendorf has um, shown us and um, she has lots of different advertising bears and um, bears from um, many, many different um, decades, so that also is very interesting. And then we have Mary um, Turk, who is um, showing us some of her um, polygraphy, um, and that is very, very interesting. It's um, things that are made um, with wood and then um, different shapes are um, built into them. And she has a number of women's pictures and then she has some beautiful um, floral um, pieces too with the pyography. So that also will be interesting. So sit back and enjoy and I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jim Carey and I'm a longtime Sheboygan resident and I'm here today at the Sheboygan County Historical Society as part of their third Saturdays um, showing my collections that I've accumulated over my lifetime, uh, my Civil War stuff and my World War II stuff. Um, sadly, according to my wife, this is just a small percentage of what I do have in my basement, but that will remain my secret. I'm also here promoting my Civil War novel, Echoes from Home. It's been out for over a year and has been very well received, and I would encourage anybody who would like one to stop by, and I'll be glad to sign it for them. Uh, what we're looking here is one of my Civil, Civil War collections. Um, this diorama depicts General George Custer's cavalry skirmishing with uh, General Jeb Stewart's cavalry on the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, it was a very small skirmish. Uh, the cavalry's job was to go out and be the eyes and ears of the army, and sometimes they just happened to meet at the same place and would fight a very brief, small, and often very bloody battle. Um, and in this case, that's exactly what happened here. I've been collecting toy soldiers since I'm about six or seven years old. Uh, I guess we can blame my mom for that. She's the one who got me interested in history and started giving me toy soldiers for Christmas and birthday. And I just have never been able to let go of the passion. Um, now we're looking at a, a model kit I built about 20 years ago made by the Lindbergh Model Company and it shows a Confederate artillery unit 
uh, the four horse team, the caisson with the two uh, attendants on it, and then the cannon carriage itself. Uh, what we're looking at now is a portion of my World War II collection. Um, this depicts uh, an armor battle between uh, American forces and German forces. Uh, and I tried to bring a variety of different vehicles. We have some American tanks and some half tracks. And on the German side, we have their half tracks, uh, a mobile anti aircraft platform, and two Tiger tanks, and the infamous 88 uh, millimeter artillery gun that was probably the best piece of artillery in the the entire war. Uh, behind that are some composition figures from the 1950s um, made by a company called Miller. Um, they're very unique and I'm not sure if you can see it from here but the figure in the tan uniform is actually supposed to be General Douglas MacArthur. And some of the other figures were designed or sculpted to resemble some of the movie stars of the action films of that era. There's a pose of a man in a foxhole where you only see his head, and that is supposed to be a look-alike for Robert Mitchum, the actor. Behind that, we have uh, two of the American fighter planes of the era, a P-51 Mustang and a P-38 Lightning. Good morning. My name is John Swart. I've been working on a little research project during the last couple of months on the strafing of Sheboygan Falls and Oostburg that occurred back in March of 1958. The story was pretty much lost and forgotten, but early this spring, one of my cousins came to me with a spent 20 millimeter casing and said, I'd like to donate this casing to the uh, museum in Sheboygan. And I said, well, you really can't donate an empty shell casing without a story. So for the next couple months, I attempted to put together what has transpired and what the story was all about and create a 55-year-later status report. Back in March of 1958, three homes in the area, two in Sheboygan Falls and one in Oostburg, were hit by 20-millimeter cannon shells from a B-47 reconnaissance bomber. Um, also, some shells hit the streets in Sheboygan Falls, and one of them landed a few yards in front of a squad car. Uh, and this all occurred around 7 o'clock in the evening on a Monday night. It was a rainy, cold, dark March night. The newspaper articles were uh, very extensive, indicating that uh, everybody was safe, no one was hurt, and after a number of years, the story just disappeared. And resurrecting the story during the last couple months, it's kind of interesting that uh, while no one was injured during this incident, two people were within a couple feet of the shells that came through the roof of their house, houses and could have very easily created fatalities. So it's been an in interesting project. And talking to the families that were involved, we had the Navante family in Sheboygan Falls who lived uh, very close to the point. We had the Dealey family from the southwest side of Sheboygan Falls that lives close to uh, St. Mary Cemetery. And then the Tooney family that lived on the northwest side of Oostburg. So it's been a very interesting assignment and uh, got a lot of enjoyment out of it. And just appreciate uh, all of the help that the various family members have contributed. This uh, photograph shows the uh, Air Force investigation team that came to Sheboygan Falls on Tuesday morning, March 18th, and also includes the uh, county sheriff and the Sheboygan sheriff. Um, this is at the Novanti home, uh, and right across the street from uh, the point, uh, just off of Highway 23. This second uh, photograph is a picture of the uh, bedroom on the Novanti home also. And it indicates and shows where the dresser was right above the little girl's head is a scar in the wall. That's where the bullet hit the wall. If you look at the top of the dresser, which has been pulled away from the wall, you can see a nick in the top edge of the dresser. And uh, the little girl is holding her piggy bank, which was hit by the bullet as it came through the roof 
glanced off of the uh, piggy bank's head, nicked the uh, dresser, and hit the wall. Just one week prior to this uh, event, the dresser had been off to the right, and the crib had been where the dresser was. And when this incident occurred, Sally, the little girl, was in her crib. This third photograph of the hole in the ceiling at the Dealey House indicates and shows where the bullet came through the roof. It actually burrowed its way through a ceiling joist before it went through this plaster ceiling and then landed on the uh, linoleum floor, bounced around, and ended up underneath the bed. Uh, the uh, police officers there are looking at where the hole came, where the bullet came through the ceiling, and uh, fortunately, it lost a lot of energy when it uh, went through the ceiling joist and didn't continue on through the house. On the table here, we have a uh, model of the B-47 bomber which uh, was the uh, source of the shells that hit the homes. This uh, model was given to the Dealey family uh, a couple months after the event occurred. The uh, silver sh bullet and shell is a dummy that was also given to the Dealey family. And the uh, brass casing is a brass uh, empty casing that came from the Heidemann farm near Hingham. Uh, all three of these items have been donated to the museum for fu future use. Uh, the items laying in front of the uh, models is a scrapbook that was uh, created by Harriet Tooney uh, during the course of uh, the event. Since it was national-wide coverage, she received a lot of newspaper articles from around the country. The other two pictures, at black and white, is a uh, photograph of a pilot one of the two pilots in that first picture in the middle uh, actually visited the Tooney home on a couple occasions, and uh, the other two pictures are photographs of the B-47. One of the pilots uh, was the, uh, had promised to give photographs to uh, the Tooney boys, and that's where these photographs came from. Well, welcome to the third Saturday at the uh, Sheboygan Historical Society. I'm John Mattern from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Sheboygan South High, class of 68, University of Wisconsin, class of 73. And my Sheboygan collection is a tough one to put together because I live so far away in New Mexico, but here we are today on 18 October 2013. What we have here are some photographs of a very old train car. And the reason I bought this because it just says Sheboygan right up here. Sheboygan actually had cigars, chief of them all, and that was a phrase used for many different items, not just cigars. It was for soda and uh, watch fobs and just a trademark. It's taken quite a while to find different pennants over here, and a lot of them are just what we call tourista things that you would buy when you're driving through the cities and the area. But there's Central High School there. And I've got some friends on the police department, and over the years they gave me a couple different Sheboygan police patches. And just throughout my travels, I've tried to find just whatever I can. More Central High, the World Band in the top right corner there. I played in that when I was in high school from 65 to 68. And then when I did my student teaching in Milwaukee, I actually worked with Ken Whirl, who was the nephew of the original Whirl, who had the Whirl Band here in Sheboygan. And as we move down here, an old license plate that was in the garage at my neighbor's house, so they let me have that when I was a little kid, and I just hung on to it all these years. Bank bags from three different banks. The one on your far right is quite, quite faded, but it's still a Sheboygan bank bag. On the table over here, we've got my bar tokens from Sheboygan. These are really tough to find when you live so far away from home. And to make them easier to see, I've taken the time to put everything in alphabetical order. So this one starts with Al and Al's. And a lot of people don't realize that bar tokens at one point were made out of metal. So those are very, very desirable, very collectible. And my collection goes all the way from A through Z, way over to here to a place called Zimmy's Bar. So it's really neat, neat getting all these sort of things. Uh, stamps also, 
They are canceled, and it actually says Sheboygan, Wisconsin on them. These are stamps that are pre-war and all the way through the mid-50s. My grandfather was Dr. H.L. Rose, Marquette University, class of 1912. And this is what he had in his office. We talk about having to be bilingual these days. Well, in those days, from 1920s to the 1950s, it was not unusual to have it in German and English. And in my grandfather's case, the terms were cash now. Here is a check from the German bank of Sheboygan, and this is dated 1861, which is right at the start of the Civil War. Very difficult to find, and I've got stuff like this hanging all over my home. Speaking of money, this is known as obsolete currency. This is only printed on one side. This is a complete set, a one, two, three, and five dollar bill. It does not have an exact date on it. It just says 1870, and then the banker is supposed to fill it in at their discretion and put them out into the community. In 1954, Sheboygan had their centennial, and these are not wooden nickels. These are more called wooden flats, and they made them with a one, two, and a five for a nickel, a dime, and a quarter, and they were differentiated by colors, and these were only good if they were not broken until a certain date during that particular festival. And as I said earlier, the chief of them all was a Sheboygan cigar, so we've got that here. One of my prize collections are what's known as national currency. And there were about four to 5,000 national currency banks in the United States, and every one of them had a, their own identification number. This was known as a charter number. This was the Security National Bank up in, uh, in Sheboygan. And this number was 11150. They made two types, type one, type two, and if you know what to look for, then you'll know the difference. But the prize piece of my collection is this $20 bill, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, from 1929 to 1935. This is the first one ever printed. So the serial number was the A series, A000001, A. I followed that on auctions for four years and lucked out enough to find this one. And on my final table here, we've just got my collection of medals and ribbons. Some of these are political, and some of them are having to do with unions, but most of them are actually religious medals. Some of these date back to the 1880s, 1890s, and it's quite a conglomerate, but they all, in some form, no matter what language they are in, they will say Sheboygan, and most of them will have a date on them also. Getting more close to Sheboygan, if you can be that way, we have Central High School, North High School, and actually I wore this beanie at Farnsworth back in 63 and 64. These two little uh, awards here are from the Sheboygan County Fair in 1943. And this I bought upstairs. So make sure you go upstairs and buy one of these. The Redskins was a great team back from 38 to 1951. Coming further over, I wear this one too, the Sheboygan Legion, post-83, but it's too small for my head. And more medals and pendants and a lot of watch fobs. And they always say, she-boy again. One more over here. If you can zoom in maybe on the top left one, evidently there was a club of people who had beards back in the 50s, which was kind of unheard of unless you were a, I don't know what you might have been, but there it is. A very old phone book if you need information back in the 30s. And I started collecting Sheboygan spoons a number of years ago before the price of silver went up, and I never realized until just recently that they're all sterling silver. I just thought they were just cheap spoons that say Sheboygan, you know, cheese, church, chairs, and children, stuff like that. This top one here is really a neat one because it's got a swastika on it. And it still says Sheboygan. Swastika was really a good luck symbol until the war. And the last couple pieces over here are old tax certificates signed by John Gee in the 1880s. I'm Pat Mollendorf. I'm happy to be here today and tell you about my collection of teddy bears. 
My first teddy bear that I had is actually named Teddy, and he's kind of over in the corner. He's with the red shirt on there, so I got him <clears throat> when I was born. And it just kind of evolved since then. Probably when I was in fur making back in the, in the 60s and my kids were little, I decided to try to make my own bear. And I started with a mink teddy bear, and I marketed him through Neiman Marcus many, many years ago. And I wish I would have kept one for myself, which I didn't. So then as I saw cute little bears through the, through the ages, I had to start collecting the bears. I like the advertising bears because they all had their separate personalities and they kind of depicted the, the company that they were advertising for. I found Harry Heathrow, who's kind of in the middle there, and he's from the, the London Heathrow Airport. And they do have many of those, I guess, throughout Europe, but um, didn't get to collect all of those. Um, I do have Teddy Roosevelt up in the corner here, and he's also a Teddy that that talks. Can't talk to you today because he's in, encased in the, in the big cabinet here. One of my favorite ones is on the top, and he's from the Civil War era. He's the only teddy bear that has actual human teeth. So I, I like him a lot. He's, he's got a mind of his own. He sits on the top of my couch, and every once in a while he'll jump off. There won't be anybody around. I'll find him on the floor. So I don't know what's, what's happening with that teddy. But I do have the uh, Smoky Bear. Teddy's on the bottom. I have the Beerstein Bears, which you'll see over on the other case, which uh, are, the one is sitting in the little wood, wood wagon. And all these come, the bears come in various sizes from, from big to little. Just like the Firskin Bears, which is on the bottom down here in, in the case, that's the largest size that the Firskins made. And then it goes to the one sitting in the corner and the small, tiny bears that uh, are all dressed with the policeman bear and the, the Air Force bear. Um, the foreign bears that I brought along today, the most um, well-noted bear, I guess, would be the one in the back, which was a Mishka bear, which was from the Russian Olympics that the um, United States boycotted. And I find that he's a very valuable bear now. And I have probably six or seven of them. So I'm going to hang on to them for a while. Um, then you go over to the, the teddy bear toys, which um, are the Sokies and the rubber bears that squeak and the little roly-poly bears. Um, the bears in the front are, are foreign bears that have been collected from travels. My, daughter-in-law brought back the, the Chinese bear from China for me, and my girlfriend brought back the, the little German bear when she was over in Germany. And then I had the, the little bear with bagpipes, too. Now, all of those bears also talk and, and make noises and things. Snoozy over there on the, on the bear rug, he's a snoring bear. Right now, he doesn't seem to be snoring. He, too, is very temperamental. Not as much as... Um, this little bear here, Bubba Bear. Hey, are you doing anything important? Are you paying attention? Will you play with me? He comes with the voice of Jeff Foxworthy, so he, the kids really like him. They like to play with him a lot. And he's one of my favorites, too. So that's about the history of the bears. I suppose we could talk about the Stifes and the Hermans and, and all those, and I have some of those bears at home too, but I have them in cases and they were kind of hard to get out of. Oh, another bear that is, bears that are really interesting are these little tiny, tiny bears that's made in China. There's a lady that, that puts them together stitch by stitch. I mean, there's no machine work on it at all and they're very hard stuffed and I find they're, they're getting to be very collectible. I think they were about $50 when I started with them and now they have just tripled in price. She also makes some that I have a, a little locket bear that the bear actually opens up and there's a little locket in the center. Another one that's, that you wear, you know, around your neck on a chain. So they're getting to be very, very collectible. And um, I would look for those if you're out in the store and probably try to pick up a real good value there. So I thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy my collection. My name is Mary Turk and I have a collection of pyography I'm showing at 
the Sheboygan County Museum this morning. And my collection started with these two pieces that were in the family, and they're over 100 years old. And I will explain that the word pyro, meaning fire, thus pyrography. And um, my collection consists basically of these pieces of women in profile. And there have been times I've gone for years and not found a single piece. Um, some of the pieces, these two pieces are over a hundred years old. This piece is dated 1907. This piece just made the hundred year mark 1912. This glove box is 1900. And um, basically it's an unusual collection or what I have been collecting, but it's been very enjoyable. Thank you. Okay, you know, just one of those things mm -hmm. you, you kind of did, but now look at when you get in a special oh, yeah. How do you do? My name is Bill Wangaman. I'm the city historian for the city of Sheboygan. It's a uh, job that's been uh, sponsored by the city. Uh, I have a lot of benefits. That is, I get no pay and I have no office, but I got a uh, lot, of, lot of hours I can spend uh, doing what I like to do. All around me is a collection of photographs that I've gathered over the years. Many of them come out of the city of Sheboygan Files. Uh, I find them in the city hall, buried here, there, and everywhere. Some of them were given to me by people who uh, have photo collections at home. People call up and say, well, Grandma died, and I don't know what to do with the photographs. And so they, they give them to me, and I've collected them, and I probably got maybe 2,000 or more. Right now, what we have here is just a small portion of what we uh, have collected over the years. And it's sort of uh, a view of Sheboygan frozen in time. Every time you take a picture, you're freezing history for just one moment or two. So I've got uh, many different categories of photographs uh, from the police department and the fire department, from city offices. Uh, the first aerial photographs taken of the city were taken in 1925. Uh, there are pictures of uh, various buildings all around the city, many of them that don't exist anymore. So the collection just goes on and on and on, and uh, people have shown a lot of interest in it over the years. And we have a uh, section on World War I and World War II and some of the people that were involved in it. And of course, having been on the police department myself, that's the biggest collection I have. But uh, it's an enjoyable pastime, and I put on many programs during the year at uh, different uh, places around the city, uh, request uh, PowerPoint programs and the like. So it's a collection that uh, I hope I can pass on to someone someday. So thank you very much. My name is Scott Lewandowski, and I'm the Assistant City Historian for the City of Sheboygan. And I'm at the Sheboygan County Museum today with a collection of old postcards of Sheboygan. And I enlarged some of the postcards to fill up the table and also to give people a little better view of the postcards. And on the table I have some postcards, like I have two of them here, that show North 8th Street. One is about 1930. And then this one is the same angle from about 1960. One postcard that I like to always point out is this one. And it's really not a spectacular picture, but it is signed on the bottom by the person who made the postcard and owned the postcard company. And his name was G.C. Wincher. And he even writes on the postcard that this is one of my views and on the back he writes that he is also in the postcard business. So I've always liked this one. Uh, over here is a picture from a postcard and it shows the interurban car number 27. 
Uh, car 27 was donated to the Railroad Museum in East Troy, but it could not be restored. But car 26, which was a matching car, was also donated to the East Troy Railroad Museum. And they were able to restore that one, and they used quite a few of the parts from car 27. So car 27 does exist partially yet. Well, hello, my name is uh, Bill Sharp. I live in Sheboygan, grew up in Sheboygan, and uh, I'm here today at the Sheboygan County Muse Museum. And uh, I brought my uh, Arrowhead collection out for public showing. And it's a hobby that uh, my father and I uh, began back in the late 60s. And uh, all these artifacts were basically found in Sheboygan County on the southwest side of the Sheboygan Marsh. And uh, my grandfather started his homestead there many years ago. And he bought a piece of land and he broke the land and the sod loose with a horse and plow one furrow at a time and he found a spearhead and uh, that started it all. The interest that he had was passed down to me and uh, my father and I would go out on the weekends in the spring or in the fall or whenever we knew that the conditions were right. A lot of times my, my uh, uncle would say, well I just plowed this field here and if you guys wait for a rain It'll be just perfect for uh, finding some arrowheads out in, in the fields. So he'd, he'd give us the okay and he'd give us a, the direction which field to go and we'd spend some time together and we'd carry a, a stick for turning stones over as we'd go up and down the, the furrows or the cornfields. And if we were lucky enough, we'd, we'd find them laying right out in the open. Uh, but most of the time they're uh, half buried or so then we'd look for an edge or a point or a, the back back end of the arrowhead and that would, or we'd see the flaking on, on the individual stones. And then we knew we'd have an artifact in we spent 30 years, we'd spend hours at a time, but over 30 years, I collected roughly 300 artifacts, and uh, it's just been a, was a wonderful time for me and my dad to spend together, not only finding the arrowheads, but going out there for the peace. In this, this, in this first uh, display, I have, uh, couple of axe heads and this here it has a sharp edge on the back here that was probably a handheld axe and whereas these are uh, got some uh, grooves in them for banding around a, a stick and something like like these these are uh, hoes and this here is a trihedral axe or ads, and I've been told that that's about 8,000 years old. And this here is like a, a paint bowl. I was called a paint bowl, but it, it can be turned over and used probably for um, making fire by friction with a, a drill type apparatus. And we have some celts here. In this next uh, display, I have uh, a number of awls, stone awls, and, and drills. And uh, I have some larger spearheads. And I have a copper, a copper awl here that my grandfather had found. And when my mother was young, uh, my, my grandfather used to pay her 10 cents 
a row to row to hoe the weeds away from the sugar beets. And apparently the story goes that uh, my mother was so hard, working so hard at hoeing the sugar beets that she didn't see this arrow laying in a row. So my grandfather kept that in mind and uh, when he, uh, it was one of the arrowheads that he gave me. And in this final box, I just have some more arrowheads. They're, they're, instead of having the notched arrowheads, I have the tang point style arrowheads up here on the edge, top edge.